Thank you very much, um, Governor. Uh, <coughs> it is a good, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be back home. Uh, this house is, is my house. I lived here for two years and a half, and I feel that I have never left, <laughs> because every time I come, I see my friends, um, and I'm welcomed as before. So I want to thank the ARC for giving me the opportunity to share with you our work on capital flight. And of course, I want to thank DC for hosting this, uh, this major event. Uh, I want first to acknowledge that uh, the presentation I'll make is drawing on our work, our recent work and ongoing work within the context of the ARC project on capital flight and safe havens, which is co-led by myself and my colleague, Idi Ajay, sitting on my right. Yeah, it has to be on my right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, which uh, is includes um, uh, the top researchers uh, in the areas of capital flight, governance, tax evasion. Many of them are here. Uh, Melvin is going to be presenting a paper this afternoon. He's sitting in the back over there. Humphrey Moshi is somewhere around here, who is uh, the expert on transparency and governance. And money laundering, if you want to know about not how to do money laundering, but how money laundering is, is done, you ask to, you talk to Moshi. And uh, Abi, Abi Kadir, who is also uh, an expert on tax evasion, is uh, also uh, a contributor to the, to the, to the project. And uh, we're going to publish a book with uh, 16 chapters, which is now under preparation by the, by the uh, OUP, uh, co-edited with uh, EP. So we hope that this will again elevate the, the debate on uh, capital flight, illicit financial flows, safe havens in Africa, uh, so that we can actually take, start, begin to take them seriously. Uh, when uh, E.B. and uh, his colleagues began working on capital flight in the 90s, yeah, 90s, that was an academic exercise. As a, as a development economist, macroeconomist interested in in uh, ex economic exchanges between the continental rest of the world, I came much, much uh, came on much later, uh, where I was interested again as a development economist on understanding how how come uh, an Afri an, a continent which is capital starved would have actually uh, be the one financing the rest of the world. It sounded very puzzling, and it would, I would never have dreamed that this issue would have could come to the to the highest level of policy debate as we are seeing today uh, with the uh, ECA and ARC playing the leadership role that they have to play in bringing this issue on, on their, to the attention of the public. So I'm very grateful that we have come a long way to actually bring this issue at the attention of the policy makers. So uh, the presentation that I'm going to make uh, today is, uh, is only trying to make four very important but simple uh, propositions. One, which is that capital flight is an economic development issue in the sense that it has severe economic uh, implications on economic development. In the sense that the, the, the losses, the opportunity cost in terms of foregone development is very, very high. The second point I make is that it's a policy issue in the sense that the evidence of rising high capital flight is actually a testimony of bad policy or policy failure not just on the continent, but globally. And I want to emphasize that. Because many times it's easy to pick on Africa, corruption, and so on. But if I keep saying, I'm going to repeat it today, if there was only one continent which is corrupt, then there would be no capital flight. Because capital flight could not go to a terrain which is clean. So if capital flight happens from Africa, for due to many things, including corruption, it's because at the destination also there is a lot of corruption and, and lack of transparency. So it's a global, it's a global issue, not just an African issue. But I also want to make the third point, which is capital flight, is an equity issue in the sense that uh, capital flight benefits the top political and economic elite in the continent and abroad also, and it takes away the resources that could have advanced the interests of the poor and the middle class. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that actually magnify, exacerbate income inequality on the continent uh, and globally. 
And I want to make the, fourth, the fifth point that you'll see in the, in the presentation is that it's a moral issue. In the sense that this money that's fleeing the continent belongs to, to Africa, belongs to African, the African, the African people, and should be repatriated to, to the continent. And uh, Melvin will, will say more about this uh, in, in the afternoon. So that's basically, in case you want to, to, to relax and, and even uh, take a nap, these are the four points I want to make. You don't have to follow the presentation. You have understood my point. <laughs> it's an economic development issue. It's a policy issue. It's an equity issue. It's a moral issue. Now we can go to sleep. <laughs> okay, so um, as I said, the, the presentation will draw from many papers, including ours and in the, in the 16 chapters in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the volume, which is why when it comes to question and answers, I will not answer the questions. When you, ask, when you raise the question, I'll tell you who will answer the question. It will be E.B., Abi, Melvin, Moshi. I will not answer the question. <laughs> Witness, be ready to answer the question. Um, so, but first of all, uh, why do we even care about this issue? To give a context, you have heard this morning that Africa, there are many things to celebrate on the continent. It's a continent that has accelerated uh, growth over the past uh, decades, especially since the turn of the, the century. We have heard about exuberance, the African lions, and now it's really pleasant to read the news about the growth in Africa. After the, the uh, you remember in the 80s and 90s, you couldn't even open a newspaper without seeing very negative uh, representations of Africa. The dark colors justify this, this positive growth. Uh, we have seen improvements even in, in the area of social development and economic uh, stability, political uh, governance, um, uh, school achievements are, are increasing, health, access to health is increasing, and we, at the same time, we see that there, there has been a rising volume of capital inflows from, from the rest of the world in the form of private capital, foreign direct investment, uh, official aid, and migrant remittances, which doesn't get enough attention, the yeah, attention that it, it deserves. But even with this, uh, this much to celebrate, there is uh, still a lot of uh, concerns. Uh, one is that Africa still faces huge financing gaps. This morning you heard the Executive Secretary talking about the huge infrastructure gap. We, we are lucky to be in a place where actually we can run a meeting for three, three, two days without having facing a power cut. This is rare. Many African countries face sharp deficits in energy, transport, and um, all other infrastructure. So Africa, even though they have, we have seen rising uh, financing, we still have, a, 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 we still face a large and even growing financial financing gaps. At the same time, although poverty is, is declining, it is not rising, it's not declining fast enough. In fact, in some, in some countries, you see poverty rates increasing as, as opposed to, to decreasing. And we have high levels of inequality, which is probably one of the reasons why poverty is not defining su uh, sufficiently as, uh, as growth rise, uh, uh, increases. To give you an illustration, this chart shows you the poverty rate uh, in Africa compared, Sub-Saharan Africa compared to, to East Asia. Looking at uh, uh, the poverty rate, which is the thick blue line, and you can see that depending on where you start, you can see that poverty in Africa has declined from 59 to 40, 48. But worryingly enough, if you look at the um, number of poor people in Africa, it is actually increasing. So, and this is true only in Africa. So we have a lot of things, we have a, 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 lo a long way to go before we can actually uh, see growth that benefits the majority of the population. So more needs to be done. Uh, to accelerate growth and, and uh, reduce poverty. And so far, traditionally, in the policy debate, when it comes to thinking about ways to increase uh, uh, growth and reduce poverty, the attention has been pre predominantly focused on attracting more resources from outside, increasing domestic uh, and, and also domestically. So let's raise more resources, invest more, accelerate growth and reduce poverty. Very sensible. At the same time, there has been much less emphasis on uh, stemming the outflow of resources from the continent. Because 
if we only increase its we, we increase inflows and more money is leaking out of the continent, on net basis we are we are we are we are, we are retaining very little, in an insufficient amount of resources to finance to finance development. But I think this is changing, and this this seminar is the testimony of a shift in policy focus that policymakers now are beginning to take attention to, to pay attention to the issue of uh, illicit financial flows, and this is very very good news.